The Wii was, by all accounts, a big success. It sold, what, a hundred million units? That's a lot of consoles. But there's one tiny little design flaw in the console, something you probably never thought much about, but which ended up costing Nintendo millions of dollars and a handful of lawsuits too. Let me tell you about the problem with the Wii. It all begins with the reveal of Nintendo's next console, which back then didn't even have a name. But what it did have is this bizarre looking controller. I say controller, but to most people it looked more like a TV remote. And you used this remote to swing golf clubs, bowl bowling balls, and hit tennis balls. But while most people watching this reveal were impressed, there was one man who felt a different emotion. Worry. Meet 34-year-old Gordon Jackson, a marketing manager for a company in Cambridge, UK. His face isn't publicly available, so I'll be using someone else's face. Now, while this new Wii console certainly had a lot to offer, Gordon saw a flaw in Nintendo's plans. The controller. As he put it, I was really getting excited about the launch of the Wii, but it was quite clear that once people started getting into the games, things were going to go haywire. The funny thing is, Gordon was a big fan of Nintendo's games, but it was these very games that he thought would lead to issues. Nintendo makes some pretty absorbing games, so I was convinced problems might happen. Not one to sit back and ignore his concerns, Gordon Jackson decided to register a web address and start a blog, www.weedamage.com. A few days later, he wrote his first post. The Nintendo Wii, launched in the US on 19th of November 2006, has not only been intriguing seasoned gamers, but is drawing a new crowd. Sounds like a lot of fun, and clearly this is going to bring in new gamers. But what about the potential missile you'll be holding, the Wii Remote? Here's where the Nintendo inspiration kicks in. Their solution? A wrist strap to stop said missile from leaving your sweaty paw. Provided Wii gamers comply with the above instructions and don't A. Hit their opponent, B. Hit the stuff in their living room, and C. The strap doesn't break if the Wiimote slips, everything's going to be just fine. Let's watch and see, shall we? So that was Gordon Jackson's prediction. There would be damage caused by these new remotes. Was he right? Well, within a few days of the Wii's launch, his website suddenly began bringing in tens of thousands of visitors on a daily basis. People from all around the world began sending in their horror stories of destroying their televisions. The first of these stories, funnily enough, came not from the general public, but instead from a member of the press. As Gordon noted, what might look to you like a boring beige section of wall is actually something much more significant. This is the first piece of Nintendo Wii-induced wall damage. During a particularly energetic game of tennis, the remote slipped, the strap broke, and the Wiimote come projectile came to an abrupt halt on the review room wall. We're going to have to keep an eye on these wrist straps. Now, this was from before the Wii launched, so you can imagine what happened post-launch. John, Michaela, and Bill all smashed their TVs mere days after getting their hands on the console, and this was just the start of it. Before long, a concerning pattern began to emerge. Check this out. Brandon, Eric, Aaron, Alric, Dan, Bill, Ryan, Clint, Andrew. All of these people's Wiimote problems were caused by a broken wrist strap. It was starting to look like maybe something was going wrong here. Wrist straps were breaking left, right, and center, and Nintendo needed to do something, and soon. They quickly put out a statement, quote, We are aware some customers have been playing the Wii more energetically than we may have anticipated. We have been monitoring the situation, and if needed, we will make any improvements necessary. Not only that, but every customer who had bought the console was sent an email which advised, Hold the remote securely, and avoid excessive motion during gameplay. If your hands become moist, stop and dry your hands. Well, there we go. Problem solved. It must be that everyone just had gross, sweaty hands. Dry them off, and the problem would go away. Who could complain now? 
December 6, 2006. Outside the Washington District Court, three legal firms had agreed to meet. One from San Francisco, one from Austin, and one from Seattle. Their aim? To take down the Wii Remote once and for all. Together, they submitted the following lawsuit against Nintendo. The controller is an essential component of any video game console, and so plaintiff is unable to use the Nintendo Wii for its intended purposes as a result of the broken wristband. Accordingly, it renders the Wii console, which retails in the United States for $250, useless. Nine days later, Nintendo made their move. They would offer to replace every customer's Wii Remote strap with a new, stronger one. That's 3.2 million new straps. Now, this new, strong strap would be double as thick as the original one, and this replacement was expected to cost Nintendo millions of dollars. It wasn't just pre-existing consoles, though. Every new Wii came with the strong straps included. So, by replacing the old straps, Nintendo were admitting the original ones weren't good enough, right? No. <laughs> Nintendo said again and again that this was not a recall. The current wrist strap was, quote, perfectly safe and has passed all the required safety tests. And apparently, there was, quote, absolutely nothing wrong. But what about the lawsuit? Well, here's what Nintendo had to say. We believe the lawsuit to be completely without merit. Well, they would. So, what happened next? Well, for two years, basically nothing. The case faded into obscurity. No new headlines appeared about Nintendo's faulty straps. In other words, just what Nintendo wanted. The world was forgetting. But behind the scenes, the battle was still dragging on in court. Until October 2008, that is. Because that is when Nintendo decided to settle the case. In other words, the lawsuit was dropped and an agreement was reached between Nintendo and the plaintiff. This likely involved a fairly large sum of money paid by Nintendo. <laughs> when the former plaintiff John Leonard was reached for comment, he told gaming magazine GameSite, All I can legally say is that it was resolved amicably. While this battle was going on, by the way, Nintendo changed their Wii Remote straps another time. Look at the difference between these two attachments. The old one is just some kind of band, but this new one has a lock-in mechanism. So, with the third revision to the straps created, and the lawsuit settles, it might seem like Nintendo's problems were finally over. But that is when they were hit with another lawsuit. Objection! So, the plaintiff this time was a woman named Molly Elvig, represented by the same set of lawyers who sued Nintendo back in 2006. What was the problem this time? Well, I talked about how Nintendo had put out three revisions to the Wiimote strap, right? The thin one, the thick one, and the lock-on one. Well, this lawsuit claimed that all three straps were defective and would break if you used any kind of force. The exact type of force you might use playing, for instance, tennis on your Wii. Oh dear. That's not all the lawsuit claimed, though. There was also talk of false advertising. Apparently, Nintendo's adverts were telling people to thrash the Wiimote as hard as possible, but the remote itself wasn't actually designed for this. It would break. Plus, according to Elvig's lawyers, Nintendo were going out of its way to cover up the claims of faulty hardware. Apparently, if people reported issues with the first strap or the second version, then Nintendo would note it down and report it. But if the issue was with Strap 3, the newest one, then Nintendo would pretend that nothing would happen. They wouldn't report it. It was all an elaborate cover-up, the lawsuit alleged. These were serious claims. And for two more years, this legal battle continued in court. It all finally came to an end in December 2010, though. Who won? That's a pretty important question, right? Well, I had to do a lot of digging to find that out. Unlike a lot of the previous events, this lawsuit was hardly reported on at all. So I had to dig up and read through the legal documents myself. Let me read you a few quotes. Ms. Elvig has failed to submit, much less direct the court to any evidentiary material establishing the facts that she asserts. 
once again, Ms. Elvig's failure to come forward with evidence to support her factual assertions is fatal to this claim. Blah 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 blah. For the foregoing reasons, Nintendo's motion for summary judgment is granted. The clerk of the court shall enter judgment in favour of Nintendo on all of Ms. Elvig's claims. So, in other words, Molly Elvig and her legal team kinda screwed up, or at least put forward a really shoddy looking lawsuit. It seems as though they gave almost zero evidence for any of the things they were claiming, or at least no evidence that was good enough for a court of law. So regardless of whether her claims were actually accurate, she couldn't back any of them up. And in December of 2010, the lawsuit was dismissed by the judge, and Nintendo were free. Now, was there actually an issue with those third straps? It seems unlikely. After this lock-in design was launched, the number of complaints rapidly dried up. Of course, stories of Wiimote smashings are not unheard of to this day, but they are rare at best. It turned out the solution to the broken wrist strap crisis was just making the wrist straps a little stronger. Often the simple solutions are the best ones. I don't think Nintendo will be quick to forget this disastrous blip on the Wii's launch, but I suppose it's a sort of cautionary tale to both Nintendo and us players. For Nintendo, make sure to test your controllers under all conditions. And for us, don't play Wii Sports with gross, sweaty, moist hands, you idiot. Hey, thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this, because I'm making videos like this weekly, so you don't want to miss them. And I'll see you next week. Bye!